Hey, my name is Chris Graves. I'm an extension forestry and wildlife specialist at the University of Tennessee. Many people enjoy observing various wildlife around the home. Some folks spend considerable amount of time, money, and resources trying to attract wildlife into their backyards. But occasionally, wildlife can become a nuisance, and unfortunately, some can even cause serious damage to your home. So I was asked to put this short video together to go over some tips on how to reduce human wildlife conflicts in residential areas. I hope you'll get something out of this and I look forward to kind of showing you around. Thanks. First, let's start with our definition of wildlife for this video. Primarily talking about wild, free ranging vertebrate animals. And you could buy a field guide for all these. So this should be pretty easy to remember. We're uh, primarily talking about then birds, mammals, reptiles, amphibians and fish. I probably won't get into, into a lot of details about fish today, uh, but I will probably get into some details about some of those others. Every wildlife species has different habitat requirements, and we generally break habitat down into four broad categories, and they include food, water, cover, and space. And I'm going to cover some aspects of that during this video today. We're going to talk about plants for a little bit. And I won't go through all the different plants, but when you think about plants, especially around the home, think about food and cover. So are those plants providing a food source and what type of cover are they providing? So when you think about cover, we're gonna talk about the structure of the plant. Structure meaning the vertical structure, how tall they are, and also the horizontal structure of those plants. And then what does it look like, the arrangement of those plants, how they are within the landscaping, what kind of cover does that produce for various wildlife species? So I'll turn my attention now to Nandina, and Nandina is a, a common plant that you see around homes, but it is non-native and it's invasive. However, it does provide a food source. Birds especially will eat the seeds and then they fly off and defecate. And uh, now we've got an invasive species then that's within our natural landscape, which is not okay. I don't want to get off in left field on this, but it is providing a food source. And typically when a plant like this provides a food source, let's say for birds, it's also providing a, a food source for small mammals. Now, if we kind of look and pan here at all this Nandina, you'll notice it's up against the house. So think about proximity. How close to the house are we? If your shrubbery is up against the home like this, now all of a sudden you're providing adequate cover and maybe an excellent food source right against the house. And we just mentioned small mammals, so you're probably gonna attract some animals then into your home because of the proximity of this plant. And then if you think about the structure of it, Nandina gets quite tall as you can see. And then look at how it's planted together. So it's providing good thermal cover for various wildlife species. And then if we scroll down, there's even been ground cover planted. This is winter creeper. And winter creeper has these silvery uh, veins and it has a toothed margin. So the winter creeper then as the ground cover is providing even more um, uh, cover for various wildlife species to get in there, to seek cover, to find food safely, and to spend more time right here in close proximity to the home. Another shrub we have here is winged burning bush. And winged burning bush produces seed, as you can see right here. And of course, they have these corky wings on the twigs, opposite leaf arrangement. In the fall of the year, winged burning bush turns bright red. So a lot of people then are attracted to this plant because of those fall colors. But this is another non-native invasive species. So birds and mammals will eat the seeds of winged burning bush and then spread them across the landscape. So we don't recommend it typically uh, when we're trying to go for more native landscaping. But notice the structure of this plant. Wing burning bush can get quite tall. And then the horizontal arrangement, it's very kind of bushy. And then when you plant them side by side by side, now all of a sudden we've got a lot of good cover. Again, within close proximity, pretty much against the house, which is probably gonna attract certain wildlife species to spend more time here, not just as a, for the food resource, but for the cover resources that this uh, wing burning bush, uh, these wing burning bushes are providing. Notice the arrangement of these plants. You can see space between them. We've got space, plenty of space between the shrubs and the house itself. We've got a dense mulch layer, no ground cover. So this is not gonna provide 
the, the same amount or same type of cover as some of the other examples that we noticed before. So it's real clean, it's not going to hide various wildlife species here, and it's not going to produce a, or provide a major food source for anything in particular either. Here we've got a flowering dogwood. It's a native uh, species, a really nice tree. A lot of people have them in their yards. But notice the proximity of this dogwood to the house. So here's a dogwood where the branches are almost touching the house. Some are actually over the home. And what you're doing then is you're potentially inviting uh, a squirrel or other wildlife species into the home, making the house itself part of their home range. Uh, whether that be uh, squirrels or rat snakes or other species that may make their way into the trees and then eventually they uh, end up on, on your roof. So I would make sure as far as vegetation management, managing your trees, even small ones like dogwoods, to keep uh, space then between the tree and the roof line of your house. Bradford pears are widely planted. It's a non-native invasive species and some states have made it illegal to sell. Unfortunately, Bradford pears provide both food and cover and attract a lot of unwanted wildlife species to properties. They also provide great roosting cover as well, which attract a lot of starlings and other undesirables. So I'm not a huge fan of large lawns uh, and mowing in general. However, if you have a lawn, then frequent mowing will cut down on the amount of seed in the yard, and then that then will reduce your uh, small mammal populations especially, or any nuisance wildlife that may show up and utilize your yard as a food source. So this is an example of a well-kept yard with landscaping that's not real desirable for most wildlife species. As you can see, there's not a lot of food and not a lot of cover for wildlife to spend much time around this home. This yard is frequently mowed. Look at the shrubbery. You can see it's well-kept. None of the shrubs are touching, so there's space between them. The mulch is in order. So I don't want to say that it's sterile, but it's not very good as far as wildlife habitat in general. So if this is what you're shooting for and you want to reduce wildlife around your property, then this is actually a, a really good example. Many people like to put out bird feeders. In this case, these bird feeders are about 20 feet from the house. So think about the proximity of the feeders to the home, the closer they are to the house, and some where you may have them stuck to the windows. Now all of a sudden you've got a food source that may attract some unwanted species while we're at it. Another thing to, to consider is not just the proximity, but the types of the feeders. Make sure that you know the feed stays dry. That's gonna be pretty important. And then also the types of feed, I recommend again, you wanna be very specific with which species you're trying to target and provide those specific foods that will attract your target wildlife species. Then there's gonna be less waste grain and therefore potentially less of the undesirable or non-target species that show up at your feeder stations. Another thing that we recommend is that you not throw table scraps out. So a lot of people will throw uh, fruit and, and other things outside and uh, that's definitely gonna attract uh, various wildlife to your property and maybe some unwanted species. Garbage can be a huge attractant for a variety of wildlife species and many of those becoming nuisance species as a result of poor garbage management. So we recommend that you don't put your garbage out until maybe the morning of pickup. That would be a best management practice. Also keeping everything uh, nice and sealed and then also keeping your garbage containers fairly clean and odor free. I think it's important also to mention that if you're in bear country, then you really need a bear proof trash can. If you can't afford a bear proof container, then there are good sources out there where you could design one and maybe even build one uh, yourself or make your own bear proof. Now we're gonna talk about pet food because this is an important topic and uh, a lot of people have pets. So we'll get into some sort of best management practices. One being that we recommend you store pet food indoors. And then if you can feed indoors, then all the better. The main thing though is not to just put fat pet food out so that your animals can come eat whenever they're hungry. Uh, I would say a best management practice, and most veterinarians would agree that you should feed your animal on a schedule. Maybe twice a day, you'll notice that their behavior toward food will change and their overall health may improve. 
but it's important to know that pet food is a major attractant and food source for a variety of wildlife species, so it's always best then when you can feed pets on a schedule where they eat all the food if they're outdoors or even indoors and, uh, and make sure that you're storing your pet food inside. As we've made our way around this house, uh, inspecting the outside, but you can see this lattice, which is fine, but notice this. Here's a gap, and that gap is a problem, especially if you're concerned about raccoons, skunks, and other potentially nuisance wildlife working their way under your house, and that can lead to a lot of problems. So remember, we want to inspect the outside of the home and seal up the structure. Look for any gaps. And you can see one here under this house, right here. This is a perfect place where this drain pipe is coming out and you've got all this, really just a big hole or a gap, an area, an entry point for a, a cottontail rabbit, a groundhog, a skunk, small mammals such as mice that could get under here and get under the house, into the home, uh, just makes it very easy for them to get here. So we've got to seal up the places like this to make sure nothing like this exists around our home. Some houses have crawl spaces, and even though it's not a lot of fun to access this part of the house, it's something you should do at least once or twice a year. When you get into a crawl space, obviously most people are going under there to retrieve their stuff or make sure that it's dry. In this case, we want to make sure you don't store any food items in here, but also you're looking to make sure there aren't any new openings or places, access points where wildlife may be getting in. So look for uh, scat, tracks, look for openings. Of course, if you have a raccoon or some other wildlife species that may be utilizing the area, they'll be maybe pulling insulation and other things, and it may be quite noticeable. So you want to be diligent about your crawl space. Here we have an air conditioned unit. And that's just one of the many things that's connected to the home. So anytime you have something like this that's connected to your house, then check at the construction uh, to where those things come together. Because there could be gaps, like over here at the wall, and this point over here, just check above, all around it, even below, to make sure there aren't any gaps. Under further inspection down here, if we pan and look, under further inspection, there's actually a hole under the air conditioning unit that a groundhog or a rabbit or some other wildlife species uh, could, could get under here. So I'm up on top of a roof and that can be dangerous, especially anytime you're climbing a ladder, uh, you're taking a risk. So I recommend you get professional assistance before you do this type of inspection. But you do need to check the outer perimeter of your home, uh, not just the base of it like we were earlier, but up here along the roof line. It's going to involve generally a ladder, sometimes actually getting up on top of the roof to check these places. This is a gable vent right here. Uh, this is a ridge vent up here. A lot of the newer homes today have ridge vents, and sometimes they're just not properly constructed or installed, and especially the ends may have gaps or they're not properly reinforced uh, so that something can't make its way in. So typically things like bats, flying squirrels, tree squirrels such as gray squirrels, uh, you think about raccoons, and other species that commonly make their way into the attics of homes, they just need that first little entry point and they'll oftentimes make that hole a little bit bigger but they'll make their way in. So you need to do this type of inspection, especially check all the vents, any kind of vents from the outside and maybe from the attic as well, just to check and make sure that all your uh, potential holes are sealed. And in here we have a plumbing vent, so be sure to check here as well uh, because um, this could potentially have uh, a loose shingle or some kind of hole, crack, crevice where some wildlife species can make its way in. All right, here we are at a chimney. Uh, this is not a masonry chimney, like a really nice uh, old style chimneys uh, made out of stone. This is actually a prefab or prefabricated chimney. So you've got this really just a stove pipe or chimney pipe leads all the way down uh, to the fireplace. And then what happens then is you've got then this box around it. So there's a void, there's this big space between the pipe and then the, uh, the outside walls that provide an excellent place, especially for raccoons, uh, to make their way in 
and uh, take up residence. So you want to make sure then that everything is capped off on any kind of chimney, uh, even the masonry chimneys, make sure everything is capped off to keep things out, such as chimney swifts, raccoons, and other species that might find their way in uh, around the chimney. Dormers on homes are another place to look for gaps. Sometimes they don't line up quite right and you'll have an entry point for birds and various mammals such as squirrels. Uh, here we've got a gutter and uh, I'd say the main thing with gutters is inspect those fairly regularly. Make sure none are sagging or there aren't any holes or anything, any gaps where uh, an animal may be able to make its way into your home. The other thing is just the general maintenance to keep them free of leaves and other debris, potentially uh, oak acorns and other things that may be attractive to uh, various wildlife in your area. Another thing to mention is where you have eaves and these soffits. Uh, you want solid construction, no gaps, but occasionally you'll have that, even with new construction. So be sure to inspect all these areas like this. Make sure there aren't any gaps uh, because occasionally, um, you know, things aren't lined up exactly right and you'll have some gaps that you need to fill. So we highly recommend that you inspect your attic on a fairly frequent basis, maybe two, three, four times a year, just to make sure it's clean and especially to make sure there aren't any gaps that lead to the outside. Because as we know, bats, raccoons, squirrels, a lot of those will make their way into the attic and they can cause significant damage to the home. All right, something important to mention is filling those gaps. How do you do that? Well, spray foam is definitely an option. I'm not endorsing any one product. Spray foam can definitely help fill some of those cracks, so don't forget about this product. When you think about plugging holes, and especially places where you actually need ventilation, then consider hardware cloth. It's a lot stronger than chicken wire, but hardware cloth is, comes in a variety of uh, sizes, and of course it's steel, but it's yet it's pliable. It's something you can work with and you can shape it and stuff to make it to where it fills those voids and excludes wildlife from entering your home. Here we have a live cage trap and a lot of people will try to trap and relocate wildlife. It's important to note that in Tennessee, it's illegal to relocate wildlife or move wildlife without a permit. Um, and in most states, it's illegal to move rabies carriers such as raccoons. So even though you may see a cage trap in the store and it talks about relocating wildlife and may have a picture of a raccoon, that doesn't make it legal. So that's a really important thing to, to be aware of. If you run into a wildlife damage issue, it might be good to contact a professional. Fortunately for us, we have the internet right at our fingertips. And most state wildlife agencies will have a website and located somewhere on that website should be a list of licensed wildlife damage control operators. You can contact these folks that are in private business, that do this for a living, and hopefully they'll have the permits and also the knowledge and expertise to help you. Because let's face it, it can get complicated because if you think about all the wildlife species that are out there, most of them actually are protected by state and or federal laws. So I just think sometimes it's wise to at least ask questions and seek professional help in many of these cases.